right, thank you very much for having me along today. Um, I'm replacing your uh, artillery, Eric, as you see. Now, Eric is a US Army Ranger, or used to be a US Army Ranger, so there is a, a link in what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Operation Nightingale has been running since 2011, and it's something we've been using within the Ministry of Defence, which is where I'm employed, to uh, give recovery opportunities to personnel who've been to various pretty testing um, environments. Not that way. Um, we've had people from all manner of conflict zones that have fought um, around the world and have then faced various challenges when they've come back. Um, and I defy, I've, I've never been in the military, always been a civilian and I'm thankful for it because I defy anyone to get through some of these things without having um, a legacy. So for those that don't know, these are, these are various elements that the, the British have faced um, in the last 70 plus years. Top left is the road to Basra from the first Gulf War. Uh, we have one individual, and every individual I'm going to talk about today is cleared for me to, to talk about them, not necessarily by name, so it's all been cleared. Most of them have been on national television doing it, so um, <laughs> they're hardly shy and retreating, a lot of these people. Um, so the road to Basra, we have one guy from the first Gulf War whose first job was to make sure that the individuals from the Iraqi convoy that had been hit by um, Allied air power were all dead. That's a pretty challenging thing for a young man to do. So he now sees that pretty regularly, um, a good 20 plus years on. Um, bottom left, some of you from a certain vintage will recognise that, that's HMS Sheffield. Um, that was the first British ship that was hit with the Exocet missile in the Falklands conflict in the 1980s. Um, one chap we've had on one of our sites who sadly now passed away. Um, was pretty much in the place where the Exocet hit. He wasn't on duty at the time. Um, going clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise, you've then got a mortar team from uh, Afghanistan. A lot of guys from the Afghan and Iraq wars. When I say guys, it's male and female um, throughout this. Uh, so that's a, a mortar team um, that's been uh, near a fob. And then the top right is, in fact, the Falaise Pocket uh, from Second World War. That's a very personal one to me. Um, because my father did that, he was a Second World War British Army tank veteran. He did that classic, very British thing of not talking about the war at all. Didn't mention it at all. And he said, Well, you wouldn't be interested. I'm historian, of course, I'm interested. He wasn't, wouldn't mention it at all. Till the last week of his life, he woke up each night thinking that he was in the fillet's pocket. And he was on the radio to his friend in the next tank who was hit with their um, German anti tank fire and what's called brewed up. So that the tank caught fire and immolated everyone in it. And my dad was on the radio to his friend when it happened. So he'd bottled that away for 70 years. Quite an incredible thing, the mind, it just let go at the end. So we're facing some pretty interesting challenges. Um, we've done a lot of sites, I know Rob was on this one. This is a, a site called Barra Clump, which is a, a Bronze Age burial mound on top of a Neolithic buried land surface, and a very splendid Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Um, the reason I show this, as you as archaeologists will know, one of the things you are never, ever meant to do is to sit on the section, ever. <laughs> Um, I was about to administer a, a bit of a, a word of advice to said individual who was sitting on the section when I noticed that his body wasn't there. Um, and this is a, a case of just showing that, um, I know lots of the, the speakers already have mentioned it today, um, is that people will find what they can and can't do. And we're really keen without the, throughout this process of, of the individuals on this project finding their own limits and working through them. So this is a young rifleman um, from the 4th Battalion, a chap called Tyler who was hit with an IED, uh, an improvised explosive device, lost both of his legs, um, but he found it much more comfortable to be sit excavating um, a Saxon grave without his legs on. So he just took his legs off and sat them there. Um, very, very <laughs> he's, he's a man with a fantastic sense of imagination. He was uh, part of a team that won an award for, for archaeology and it was presented in um, London at the place where they're showing the Harry Potter play. Um, so he stood there on the red carpet with his robot legs on and all the tourists are taking selfies thinking that he's one of the cast because he's got his magical robot legs. <laughs> anyway, so he was, uh, took, took his legs off to dig away and he, there's nothing that um, will stop this man. And for, from my perspective, that's brilliant because it shows archaeology students just what limits aren't in many ways. Um, this guy just cracks on, doesn't moan about the weather or the fact that he hasn't had the right lunch or whatever. He just gets on and, and does the work. One of the things we're very careful with at the start of all of this was also to um, examine what would be a challenge to the individuals taking part. Now, from my own personal prejudices, I must admit, I thought that facing digging human remains might be 
quite a challenging thing given a lot of the people on the project are there because human remains uh, are causing um, quite a few mental health traumas. As it, as, as it fact is, they, they're not bothered. They'll love digging skeletons. They'll love it. Um, there's a big enough disconnect as they saw it with an Anglo-Saxon skeleton um, to, to what they faced in theatre. And in fact, they saw that as a positive because a lot of these individuals, the Saxons, had spears, shields, drinking vessels, so weaponry and drinking accoutrements. They could kind of equate um, with their own personal past, so they had their own narrative that linked in. Um, slightly different when you deal with First World War stuff, we'll come to that a bit later on. Um, and a lot of the guys are, are, are creating their own narratives to the site that are really useful, from my perspective, in interpreting them. Um, and they gain a lot of ownership. So there's a Rifleman Singh um, from the 1st Battalion of the Rifles. He's um, getting the same magic that we all experience. He's holding a piece of um, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age pottery, probably from a, um, a short neck forehead bowl, which has got fingerprints on it. Fingerprints of the potter from 700-ish BC. And for him, that was um, a really powerful connection to people that have worked on the landscape that he's worked on as a soldier. Um, but he's seeing the same people coming doing very different things on an, an area he's been trained on. So he found that a very, very enlightening thing. Um, and the guys go off to, to careers. Most of the people that come on our sites have either been medically discharged from the military or are going to become so. Um, so they're finding ways that the, um, being in the open air, um, working with their hands, working with their brains, working with a camaraderie group, um, uh, is helping them. So this is uh, Dave from 6th Battalion of the Rifles, um, very badly uh, wounded in an IED again, a suicide attack, so he lost his arm more or less. Uh, he's measuring um, a child burial, but he's, he's finding ways that he can do all of this one-handed. Perfectly able to do it, doing all the system, he's, he's going to do the whole thing. We say we make them work from, from grave to grade, except we flip it around, so they do from grave all the way through backwards. So they're doing all the, all the field work that you'd expect every other archaeologist to do. He's a primary school teacher, has to teach about the Saxons now, so for him he's got an insight that most of the other teachers certainly won't have. Rifleman Kendrick, another great case study, he's sort of the poster boy in many ways, it has been Kenny. Um, we do all of our work with, with field units, really important that you have really good commercial archaeology um, or university archaeology with you to make sure that everything is covered. We can make sure that people on site have mental health first aid training, which is uh, an imperative especially if you've got a thunderstorm, I found. It was a really interesting experience. But the strangest things will give people um, episodes and move them away back to their theatres of conflict. Chinooks, really big one. Um, gamekeeper shooting, crows, all sorts of things. Um, Kenny was told at school um, that he wasn't bright enough to be an archaeologist, which knowing the archaeologists I know, that's a really scary statement. Um, uh, so he, he took the, a different approach to the careers advice and he moved and joined the infantry. Um, he had a couple of really bad tours um, in Iraq, um, but when he came back, he joined up, did a few digs with us. He dug this Anglo-Saxon individual here, which is bottom left. It's got a drinking vessel, um, which is a lovely 6th century bucket made of bands of uh, yew. Um, and a photograph of this being excavated with his name, Rifleman Rowan Kendrick, is now in the British Museum next to the Sutton Hoo helmet. So I've told him, get your careers advisor. <laughs> and Kenny left um, uh, the military and ended up working, working for Wessex and he's moved on to, to other units since then. So he's, he's been a real success as well. Um, they all have the dark humour on site. Um, you can, may or may not be able to work out. He's got laser written on the back of his um, hoodie. Um, laser blinded, uh, got blinded in one eye through a laser gun sight. So all of his mates just call him laser. Um, they, one of the things they really miss is ridiculing one another. So they are certainly not people that you have to be particularly delicate with uh, in, in most contexts with because they will ridicule each, each other and they, they really do enjoy that. I know that there's a pecking order in the military. At the top end it's usually your special forces, marines, paras, all the kind of really tough ones. Then it goes down a bit to line infantry. Right at the bottom is MOD civil servants <laughs> and under that is the Royal Air Force Regiment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they have their pecking order. So he's working away. Um, and we, we buddy up with, with other people as well, so we've um, worked with other universities. This is Sam, who's um, uh, uh, thalidomide, so she's got uh, much shorter arms, but she will dig with her feet. So she has specially adapted shoes, we use a leaf trowel, dig with her feet, she is amazing. So she's another one that is symbiotically working back with the military, so these guys, that if they are straight out, maybe some of them are feeling a little bit sorry for themselves, actually, do you know what, there is always a way to do something, so it's a, a really good method. 
I couldn't, as I'll put this up because it's a rare image because he's smiling. Um, this is uh, Corporal Winterton of the Rifles, or Winno. Um, he was our, um, our first individual, and he came on the project because he was going to commit suicide. Um, he was on time team saying this, so I'm not breaking a confidence. He said he's, he had a bag packed, he um, was hit with a mortar in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Um, so his military career is finished, he was a career soldier from a boy onwards. Um, he didn't know what he was going to do. Four kids, family, was going to jump off the Seven Bridge. Not because he had four kids in the family, but, uh, just because he was out of the military. Um, and the thing that kept him going was watching Time Team, actually, because he liked watching people in the open air um, doing things. So he came on, on the first of these digs. He's working this uh, Time Team experiment of doing this forge. That blew up not long afterwards. And given why he was on the project, that could have gone one of two ways. Um, but he's still smiling. Um, he worked again for Wessex for a bit as um, working on the logistics side. Did, a, I think, a reasonable job, hasn't he? Uh, excellent job, good. And he's now moved off. He now works on um, recycling bins, but he's back as a functioning person, whereas before he was in quite a dark place. There's a uh, young Tyler. Record, he's not swearing, he's just indicating he's recording his grave. So he's recording a skeleton. So with a prejudice, you might think, as we talked about this morning, uh, well, that might be a bit difficult for some guy with no legs to be able to do and get it. No, there's nothing that stops him. He will find a way, his buddies will find a way, and he's managed to record the whole thing. Sorry, difficult to see this one. Um, this is a, a Spitfire dig. This is the Haynes manual of the Spitfire being utilised for George, who's um, paralysed from the neck downwards. Um, to be able to excavate, he does a lot of the finds work. That's the thing he finds um, that he's really keen on doing. We're a bit fortunate in the military that we can lift his wheelchair onto a flatbed truck with a crane and get him out to sites, but um, there is always a way. And for others, they don't want to be part of the digging side of things. Difficult to see again, that's a, a Spitfire model kit. Some of the guys just enjoy being on the sites, being part of the team and gaining extra dexterity um, through being able to make model kits, sort of things you know you make as a as a young man, but they're, they're getting back, getting more um, uh, abilities and getting back to um, producing part of the fines reports through, through airfix kits. And we've moved international as well. These are some guys from the, uh, the Polish military who, um, uh, they're all called Lukasz, apart from Marek. There's a Marek and two Lukaszes. Uh, they're digging the remains of a hurricane from the Second World War Battle of Britain, piloted by 303 Squadron. Um, their commanding officer said it's the only time you Brits think positively about the Poles is the Battle of Britain. So we got them there excavating one of their crash sites. You get all sorts on these sites. Um, sometimes our military want to become archaeologists and occasionally you get archaeologists wanting to look military but we couldn't change Dr Harding to look very military. Um, really important we're also supported by people like Brand of Brothers uh, from Help for Heroes, Combat Stress, all sorts of the big military charities, and they're able to end the on-site close support, so we're able to use Tedworth House, the recovery centre, if we need to. And some of those military characters are able to then give something back. Uh, we've got Winnow in the high vis with a Royal Air Force guy next to him, working with the John Egging Trust, of uh, charity working with underprivileged children, um, to... to to use team working skills, that's what they're learning, um, via archaeology. So we're getting the guys who come through our program to give something back to, to other people who are in similarly unfortunate circumstances. Dickie, who's sadly not here today, was going to be presenting with me, ex Royal Marine Commando, medically discharged, now has a first in archaeology, which I don't, um, from Exeter University, working on a First World War site here. Uh, and digging a First World War practice trench. The First World War ones, are, uh, there's a proximity there that can be a tricky issue for guys who've done it for real, but they give an amazing amount of knowledge um, from their combat experiences to an interpretation of the First World War landscape. Uh, one individual in particular, a, a signaller, um, he'd done Saxon skeletons before. He found it initially disconcerting to dig up a combat victim from the First World War, given what he'd been through but rationalised it pretty quickly as it is still um, doing right by the individual in the ground. So he was able to therefore get through that process and we were with him at all times to make sure he was okay. Um, and he's now working towards a degree at Winchester University. In fact, I heard him, Big Signals unit, with this Royal Marine arguing about who'd found the prettier beads on an Anglo-Saxon grave. <laughs> it's an amazing experience. Um, just to finish with, really, um, Again, it's difficult to see, but the chap on the, uh, on the right here has got a lot of skulls tattooed on his arm. They represent individuals, friends of his, that were killed in combat. Um, he's excavating this Anglo-Saxon, and that Saxon skull is going to become the next tattoo. So it's moving up, but from a negative, perhaps to a positive, as he's moving through his career. 
Who knows, the individual here may well have had what we'd call potentially a disability, um, and it's good that archaeology can help. There should be no, no digging, we find. There's always a way, um, and it's just about working through those things, making sure that the environment, um, as just James said before, that people are aware of the, the landscape around them, what's happening, um, making sure that um, you've assessed what challenges might be, might be something that these guys have. All these people put together a, um, a questionnaire before within the military environment about uh, what, what things they would not want to face on site, and we make sure that the environment is correct for them. Um, but it is quite impressive to see afterwards when they fill in their questionnaire how they, they personally feel they've improved. And the, the tricky thing is to keep them in um, because you don't want to raise hopes after two weeks of digging in the sun with mates around a campfire, things like that, and then that's it. It's to keep them going, to get them onto degrees, to get them working in units as volunteers doing the post-excavation because digging is only, as you know, a small part of it. And then getting them on the report writing side, stuff like that. Um, so if you want to look on the websites, on Facebook, there is Breaking Ground Heritage, which is our, our Royal Marines guy set that up, Breaking Ground Heritage. There is Op Nightingale, which is an MOD project. It's all on Facebook. I think uh, Breaking Ground's certainly got a website too. Go and have a look and see what the projects are. And if you want to ever end any, lend any support, you'd be very, very welcomed. Thank you.